Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode from Ampro Engineering. This will be another installment of the Buyer's Guide covering these two Tyco Super Hoppers. Now, I'm not too familiar with these cards as I really don't remember seeing them around often as a kid, but they really are pretty easy to get your hands on if you're interested. They're kind of all over eBay. They're not that expensive and it seems that they're not usually working. So let's investigate here, see about the car, see if it's worth you even looking at. First things first, I did want to note that the cars are both missing the front bumpers. They came from the same house and I guess someone broke it off. The front bumper is supposed to look just like this, which is on the super turbo four wheel drive hopper, which we will cover in another video. So I went ahead and just reprinted a little thing on this. It's it's not going to last. It's just there cosmetically. So just a note of that, that that's one major cosmetic difference. This red one's a little worse for wear. It's missing the decals here and the decals there. But I think between the two cars, we'll get a good understanding of what the car should look like. Looking at the blue one, because again, it's cosmetics are a bit nicer. We do have the quad spotlights, which are very nice nice. These are heat staked in place so they won't come off theoretically because if you look at my turbo hopper they're also heat staked in place and they're all missing. It has a really beautifully designed body. You've got the little driver down there and it's not just the head. It's got both hands, a steering wheel, a little dash panel. It's, it's really well done. Has the spare tire here at the rear, an integrated rear wing. And if anybody looks closely at this, does this look familiar to anybody? Anything? Anything come to mind? Perhaps this will jog your memory. Does this have a passing resemblance to the Super Champ? Same type of cage, quad spotlights. Of course, the positioning is a little bit different. But what really stands out to me is the little lip here protruding from the side and coming straight back. Same here, a little lip protruding and coming straight back. The difference being there's a big wing on the back of this. But they took the Tamiya Super Champ and said, you know what's going to sell? A small version of that. But not just a small version, a four-wheel drive small version. This car is genuinely four-wheel drive. So coming around to the rear, we do have a slow and fast speed on the gearbox. And looking a little more closely, we see one motor and two motor. This is a dual motor setup. We have a rear differential and we have a front differential. So although it will be a little bit better off-road, you are still going to have the limitation of the fact that it is still technically a two-wheel drive vehicle given the open diffs. But still, the vast majority of these are going to be driven on dirt or pavement and an open diff is most likely a better option for those applications. The front shock towers look exactly like the Tamiya Bigwig. The shocks are, I think they're sprung reasonably well. These shock towers tend to twist a little bit and when they twist under load, they want to bind up. So a little bit of graphite powder in here will help. The rear is excellent. The front, they a little bit stiff. The rear, that's that's perfect. Whoever did that spring rate nailed it. You know, this car does have a double wishbone front suspension. So, you know, there really is no camber gain. And in fact, the steering geometry, if I can turn this, I really can't. There's really no bump steer either. The tires are staying perfectly straight. Front hubs are metal. Okay. Anybody that says consumer level or toy grade RC cars are junk. Here we have metal. The 1980s and early 90s was really a golden age for these scale model cars. Tires are, they feel a little bit hard, but again, we're talking about very vintage tires. The roof one is, uh, that's a probably an exact, yeah. The roof tire is this tire. You're not going to be able to change it as this tire is pressed in with that nut. Uh, so the wheel is going to stay there permanently, but you probably could change the tire if need be. This is a single pivot rear axle, unlike the later Tyco Bandit. And flipping it over, ignore the fact that the battery case cover is gone. We'll look at this one here. That's how it looks. We can see that there's a nice little pocket here for the Molex or Tamiya connector. And this does take the 9.6V battery right here. Now this is a modern replacement and this thing works absolutely well, uh, incredibly well for this application. This is the 49 megahertz version, and this is going to be your 27 band version. And this was very common back then where you would only have two variations 
of frequency to run two cars. So if you had two friends or a brother and sister or two brothers, you usually get the opposite colors. Unfortunately, if your third buddy came by, you're out of luck. And that even applies to your third buddy coming by with a turbo hopper or even a different brand like Nico is only 27 and 49 band and that is it. These aren't particularly small. They're not that big, but they're not that small. We'll compare this to the turbo hopper, which is a pretty common vehicle. And we can see that it is, you know, a bit shorter and a bit taller. So this is probably 1 16th. This one here, we're bordering on 1 12th, I would say. Pairing this to its main competitor, and we can see that actually from here, they look about the same size, but tilting it upwards, we can see that, and I'm going to try and align the front tires, that the grasshopper has got a couple of inches on it. Let's jump back on the red car because sadly the blue car is dead in the water. The light comes on, but I can't get it to do anything. So I don't know if it's just the remote that I have is incorrect or something, but that guy's not working. The little bit rougher one here works fantastic. So let's flip this over, open our battery tray and plug in our connector here. This really works well. The Tyco Bandit I've always complained about because there was just never any room to stuff the battery. This one here doesn't seem to have that big of a problem. Battery will just drop straight in there. You can kind of wedge this, it's always the case. The original Tyco batteries were significantly shorter cabled, unlike this one here, and that flips up. So this is the radio that will be working with this car. The power switch is down here. Now this is not a proportional steering car. It's either full left or full right. I don't know what that click is. I had to replace this tie rod, so I'm wondering if that's I think that's what the issue is. It's hitting something. And what's important to note is that this car will steer without throttle. There was a time where the electromagnetic servo cars would not steer without throttle. So that made steering a little bit tricky. For our throttle, we have our low speed. And this is a turbo car. So there is slow and then flooring it. We get our little speed boost. Flipping it around, we'll put it in fast, slow, and high. This thing has got some speed to it. I'm curious to see how quick it's going to go. I suspect that the Bandit is going to be faster because it's lighter, but this does have two motors, so I'm, I'm very curious to see what the performance is. In fact, let's stop being curious and take this little guy for a spin. Before we go driving it, I did want to note one thing on this car that's really important. On a lot of these cars, just prior of the 9.6 vintage, when you would accelerate and turn in low gear, it would just turn. But usually when you accelerate and turn in high speed on the radio, it would drop into low. This car does not, which is interesting. I'm very surprised to see that. Cars like the Turbo Hopper, as well as this little guy here. Again, this is a eight double a car these will both drop into low gear when turning but this does not the car is in slow gear in the transmission so we'll start by just driving around in slow Right, the car is now in fast and we've got our GPS speed meter there. It's set at zero KPH. Let's see what it does. It's really going to take off a lot slower because of the gearing. It's still in low on the radio. Get a high speed run in now.
Yeah, it's 20 kph. I'm surprised to see that. This is a heavy car. There is always something, at least to me, to be said about Tyco cars from the 1980s and the early 90s. These cars were really well made, and it's a testament to the fact that whoever beat the heck out of this car something of 30 years ago still didn't kill it. I mean, it's still operational. There was really no glitching. It ran well. It's remarkable to see something this old with this price point to be this operational. Speaking of price points, these weren't necessarily cheap cars. You wouldn't go to the toy store and spend, oh, $50 on this like you would today. This was probably bordering $100 in the early 1990s, which was not a trivial amount of money, given the fact that a box grasshopper would be around that price as well. But you'd have to buy the radio, the battery charger. In this case here, you'd just buy the battery and the charger and the 9 volt for the radio. The question, of course, is do you want one? For the collector, I, I really don't see this car as a great collector's piece because it's not old enough to have been really in that golden age heyday of RCs, but it's not new enough to have been forgotten. It's still a pretty amazing little car, but I don't see this on the shelf of a collector, unless of course you are obsessed with these older consumer level or toy grade RC cars, then get yourself a good one. Like I said, the prices of these aren't that high. I've seen people asking way too much for cars that don't work or cars that are in rough shape, but I would find yourself a nice, clean, solid, or boxed one of these and park it on your shelf. I really can't see these things appreciating that much, at least given current prices. If you're looking for something to rekindle your youth and you used to have one or you always wanted one, my answer to that is always absolutely. Go get yourself one of these. You should be able to get a pretty decent one for 80 bucks or so. And you do want to make sure that it does have the radio and it is operational. They're not too hard to get working. If something's not fried, you can reflow all the solder joints, find yourself leaky capacitors. These have analog boards, so they've got all their electronics exposed and pretty easy to get to. But if you're not an electronics whiz, they're not impossible to fix, but they might need a little extra help. And if you're looking for just something to just run around and have a great time with, I wouldn't say this is a very good idea. These plastics are very hard. They're getting older and brittle by the day. Tires are getting harder and harder to come by. It's not like you can jump it. I mean, these, it has suspension, but I mean, it's minimal at best. Perhaps a curb, perhaps, but not much higher than that. And granted, I know that when these were new, they were launched off of whatever kids could find, but Today, there's much, much better vehicle that you can buy for this price point, especially on the secondhand market. If you do find one of these that is non-operational, a hobby grade conversion wouldn't be too bad. I mean, these would be very easy to install oil-filled shocks. You can install a nice modern ESC capable of putting down some more power to these motors, as well as a higher end servo. And it's a bit larger of a car, so you're gonna have a lot more room to work with on the inside. Well, folks, that about wraps up this buyer's guide. I hope you enjoyed it. I know there's usually not that much information on these two cars, despite how easy they are to find usually. So I hope this information helps you out, especially if you're not too familiar with the 80s and 90s consumer level RC cars. Thank you all so much for watching. I've got a new video coming up very soon.